Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's our last class. I just wanted to thank you guys. Thank you personally for being here. Appreciate that. Um, just a few messages before we begin with our guest lecture today. So unfortunately, uh, the TA is not going to be able to finish the marking for us. So there are a few marks that are up online right now. You won't be able to see them, but the lion's share is given to the TA. So that's, and that's our quiz two, which won't be done for probably another few days, okay, just so you know. Um, if you have problems viewing your grades as of right now, so for quiz one and the first midterm, not quiz two, because that hasn't been done yet, so the quiz one and the midterm, if you have problems viewing your grades there, if you, for instance, gotten a grade because you wrote them, right, and it's not reflected on CU Learn, please email me immediately, okay? And if you can, send me a picture of your grade on your book, on your exam book, if you can, okay? Upload that. You can do it through your phone, okay? We'll make that very easy on you. So if you can't see them, send them to me now. And that way you don't have to come into my office and show me, but just make sure you take a picture, right? <clears throat> um, any questions regarding the final so far? No? I imagine I'll get a influx of questions probably the night before, two days before. Yeah, good. That's great. I'm going to agree to that. Excellent. Um, so without further ado, uh, I want to introduce uh, a really good friend of mine, former colleague, and uh, and fellow uh, psychonaut uh, Dan Clements. Right? And uh, I'll let you introduce uh, yourself. Okay. In the class. Let's take a seat. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you for having me, welcoming me into your learning community. Um, so I'm going to lecture about uh, critical psychology, and um, this roughly covers a range from what you call anti-psychiatry in the 60s and 70s, and then what's being called post-psychiatry today. Everything is post today, right? So you need a post-psychiatry too. Um, first, I'm going to sort of try and sort of give some general ideas about why it makes sense to be critical um, or skeptical of psychology and psychiatry. So I'm going to talk about um, Carl Jaspers and you know, sort of start thinking about problems, problems in life, medical problems. Um, I'm going to talk about Big Pharma and the DSM. And I'm going to talk about, you know, some of the really successful rhetoric in psychology and psychiatry, and how we can sort of start to understand or gauge the successes or the sort of achievements in the fields of psychology and psychiatry. Then we're going to do kind of a, an historical overview of critical psychology, uh, starting with what I consider to be sort of the roots of critical psychology in what's called critical theory. I don't know if you're familiar with the Frankfurt School. Um, Marcu Marcuse is probably the best known we're talking about Fromm and Marcuse. Um, so that's, you know, circa 1955. Um, then we're going to talk about more core anti-psychiatry figures. Um, I think you're already somewhat familiar with Thomas Zaz or Cizaz. Um, Irving Goffman, Ivan Illich, Artie Lang, and Thomas Sheff. And then we'll get into post-psychiatry. So these are more contemporary works from the 2000s from roughly 2002 to uh, 2011 um, that sort of bring these insightful ideas from the past and sort of update them. Uh, I have written here that it's, um, post psychiatry is a return to, a revival, and a refinement of these past ideas. Uh, so you could say that that is my thesis. I'm sort of argue a kind of continuity from the sort of history of critical psychology to post psychiatry today. If I had to say that I had a particular objective, I'll admit that it is to some extent to try to persuade you or to kind of plant a seed of doubt or a reasonable doubt, uh, sort of to have you rethink what you think you know about psychology and psychiatry. I also want to address the question of relevance, which I think is always a good question. Um, why do we care? And also specifically, why is this relevant to personal identity? And on that, I'll just sort of say that, on the one hand, our response, uh, collectively and as individuals, to problems, uh, to something going seriously wrong in someone else's life. Um, how we respond is uh, something that I think tells us a lot about ourselves, again, both as individuals 
and as a sort of collectivity. And more personally, when something is up or wrong or off with you, um, how you respond to trauma, crisis, uh, misery, uh, I think matters a great deal. I think, you know, it's not controversial to say that, you know, there are some situations where, you know, a person needs, let's just say needs a friend. And there are obviously other situations where you need a doctor, right? And when we start thinking about and sort of getting into the details of psychology and psychiatry, we start to think about, you know, how do you know which one you need based on what kind of problem you have or how severe or intense it is. Sometimes you need both, a doctor and a friend. Uh, sometimes you might need personal guidance and sometimes you might need medical intervention. And how we make that distinction or where we draw that line or that threshold of personal problems and needing sort of professional help um, is very much central to the debate about psychology, psychiatry. So I'll say, please uh, hold your questions till the end. Um, I'm going to, I sort of have a lot I want to get through and we'll see how far we get. Um, there will also be a kind of informal after session at uh, Mike's place. I'm not paying for all of it. No. Yeah, he's getting the bill. Uh, don't don't worry. Just ignore what he just said. Uh, so yeah, you can, I don't know, follow up, ask questions. We can sort of mingle. Hopefully, no one has class they have to get to right afterwards. So we'll have a good turnout, and we can sort of continue the conversation or play cards against humanity or whatever happens happens. Okay. So I want to open up with a good way to start a lecture is by saying something like. A hundred years ago, Carl Jaspers wrote a book called General Psychopathology. And I'll give you sort of, I'm not going to do a lot of sort of new terms, um, but before I read the quote, you should know what somatic means at least. Somatic, uh, as I understand it, means relating to the body or, as sort of definitions go, of or pertaining to the body as distinct from the mind. Quote, Somatic medicine only deals with the individual as a creature of nature. It examines and investigates his body as it would that of an animal. But psychopathology, right, kind of an old word for you know, psychological therapy, um, is constantly faced with the fact that the individual is a creature of culture. It is our learning, our acceptance and imitation, our education and our milieu that give us our psyche and turn us into human beings. So thinking about, you know, psychiatry and having this Jasper's quote, you know, sort of keeping it in the back of our minds about, you know, nature and culture and that there are natural phenomena and cultural phenomena. Um, when does psychiatry become especially relevant to you? Well, I've already been talking about, you know, this whole notion of problems, right? We all have problems. All people have problems. And there are many different kinds of problems. Health, financial, family, relationship, professional, educational, sexual. There are social, economic, political problems, behavioral problems, personal, emotional problems, medical problems. But one thing to think about is when your personal problems become such that you can't manage them personally anymore, um, and commonly you'll be considered to have kind of a psychological problem and need professional help, or you'd be diagnosed with a disorder of some kind, right? And I say personal problems, but you could replace that word with a lot of other words, right? You could say when your family problems become such you can't manage, or when your relationship problems become such you can't manage, when your professional behavior or emotional problems become such that you can't manage, you often sort of enter this, you know, the psychological psychiatric arena, right? You cross a kind of threshold. And I'm going to come back to this idea of a threshold. I think it's, I mean, it would be foolish to deny that medical problems warrant medical solutions. Uh, but again, how can we determine when a problem gets severe um, enough that it sort of needs medical intervention? It's common with mental illness to assume that there is an underlying brain disorder. And then this assumption largely, um, I would say, defines the current sort of psychiatric paradigm or the sort of dominant narrative. 
um, the presumption of what's called individual deficit, individual deficiency. Um, that if you are experiencing serious problems, then it's assumed that the problem is in your body, located in the brain, that uh, to think back to Jasper's, that it's a problem of nature more than a problem of culture. So why, you know, doctors are experts, physicians are experts in the body, not experts in culture, so to speak. So I think it's safe to say that psychiatry interprets mental illness as a problem of nature and not a problem of culture, right? Which is a problem of nature in the brain versus a problem of culture, which is basically anything and everything that surrounds the environment that the brain is in. So critical psychology asks, have we prematurely decided that mental illness is a natural and not a cultural problem? Um, and one idea that we'll get to, but I'll mention now, um, is you know some of these thinkers are going to suggest that mental illness um, is a social construct, uh, which is going to be controversial in a way, um, but at the very least I, th I think is worth considering. One way to think about you know this divide is that you have, you know, you have culture, and instead of talking about cultural problems, it might be more, sort of, it might be easier to talk about structural problems. That tends to be how we talk about you know, um, politics, the economy, things like that. So there are structural problems in society that can give people, that can create problems in individuals' lives, and then you have nature, and it's more of a neurological level of another different kind of problems. Um, and sometimes maybe it's hard to distinguish between the two. But one thing we know is that families, parents, education, schools, um, these sort of institutions are far from perfect, let's say. And beyond that, our communities, societies, countries, politics, and economics all possess major dysfunctions, right? Um, economic inequality, political dysfunction, um, which isn't totally confined to Trump, but uh, is one consideration. So when something goes wrong with an individual that is, you know, within all of these different, you know, levels of sort of social structures and systems that were sort of embedded in our community, societies, families, etc., cetera, um, it's strange to some that why would we look to the brain for the problem and to the solution? Uh, and these people are trying to, they're making a kind of um, an appeal to common sense. That this is sort of an intuitive point that there's more evidence that there are problems at all of these structural levels in society. There's more evidence of that and compared to less evidence of problems in people's brains, right? So they would say it's strange that we would immediately assume a brain problem. Uh, and I think it's fairly common that we, you know, when, when you have, let's say, a, any news story that involves the taking of a life, right, whether it's by suicide or murder or a, a mass shooting, that th we tend to assume that there's some kind of mental ill health problem um, at the core of it, um, which I think does seem like a reasonable assumption. Uh, but the point would be that there's more evidence of other levels of society that are more problematic and less evidence of brain problems. So if it's truly an evidence-based approach, then it might be counterintuitive to assume that the problem lies within an individual's brain, chemistry, genetics, something like that. Okay. So one important idea is thinking about medicalization. Now, if you have a problem that is a medical problem, you should medicalize your approach and medicalize the way you think of it. But one, one concern is about you know the medicalization of life and the medicalization of misery, right? That a normal, healthy, fully functioning human brain can still be totally miserable and suffering and struggling. It doesn't necessarily indicate um, that something is going wrong. This might be based on what some would consider an American cultural assumption that you should, that most people should be happy most of the time, which other cultures don't share. So putting it more into a sort of 
daily sort of quotidian context. You could say that pressure and sadness and worry are facts of life. Uh, anyone who's familiar with Buddhist teachings will have come across the phrase, life is suffering, or existence is suffering. Um, so that, you know, pressure and sadness and worry, they're not only natural things that everyone, they're sort of universal human experiences, they're also needed, they're important. Um, as part of, you know, just being alive as a human being and having an emotional life, not being an automaton or a robot. So we have to think about when does pressure become stress, and when does sadness become depression, and when does worry become anxiety? And can psychiatry reliably and universally differentiate between the normal and the abnormal in these domains? Uh, and even between the sane and the insane. Right? Because when you diagnose someone or when you are diagnosed with having a mental illness or a mental disorder, it means that you are not having a normal response to something in your world or in your life. Right? It's disordered and abnormal. Um, so I think it's fair to say that you know, pressure and sadness and worry, these are you know, universal human experiences. But when, at what level, Right? Do they become pathological? And how do we know? And if there aren't clear, obvious answers to these questions, and I don't think there are, I think it is really a philosophical question, in a way, um, that how much of what feeling should someone feel at, in what situation? Uh, I don't think that there is an available medical scientific explanation or answer to that question. One common way that I think we think about, you know, okay, well, how do we know when you cross over that threshold? Um, and some would say it has a lot to do with when you can no longer work, when you can no longer fulfill your duties, obligations, your role, uh, and you can't perform tasks. Basically, when you can no longer be productive, right? When your problems are sufficient, that it undermines your productivity. Um, but again, this is, that makes us think of, you know, the world and our society very much as a kind of factory in a way, right? That when you are no longer productive, there needs to be some kind of intervention to sort of fix you and to keep you going. Sometimes, you know, in critical psychiatry, they often talk about psychiatrists as technicians of a kind of new kind of order. So that our life problems, our problems in living, right, like misery, um, that this realm may seem to shrink and sort of get smaller and sort of contract. While the domain of psychiatry and medicine um, expands, right? That the realm of personal problems shrinks and the medical realm expands as if it's sort of gobbling up all of this real estate that used to be just life problems. And it sort of rezones it as medical, psychiatric as things that can be diagnosed and treated with medications. Some critical psychiatrists believe that the application of psychiatry to human misery rarely makes things any better and often makes things worse, right? Partly because it creates an idea that you shouldn't feel misery or unhappiness. Um, and often it doesn't consider the context. Okay, so let me turn to Big Pharma and I'm going to play a really short clip and then sort of comment on it. Um, it should take us about three minutes. Um, this will work better. Questing to uh, reproduce right themselves and also uh, find their maximum advantage. With the rise of this machine model of human beings, a new idea of how to change society began to emerge. Not through politics anymore by adjusting how well the individual machines function. The technicians of this new idea would be the psychiatrists and the drug companies who would free people from the terrible anxieties inside themselves. What it would lead to would be a new form of order and control, not defined by the old political elites, but by the objective power of numbers. I just found myself constantly worrying. I couldn't. I just couldn't stop. My hands were shaking. 
and I was sure that people were looking at me and watching my hands. These college students didn't know it then, but they were each experiencing the symptoms of an anxiety disorder. Panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, social phobia, and post-traumatic stress disorder. This year, 23 million Americans will suffer from one of these anxiety disorders. They're the most common mental illness in the country, and they can attack anyone at any time. In the early 90s, an epidemic of mental disorder was sweeping America and Britain. As last week's program showed, it had been uncovered by a new system for identifying disorders. Psychiatry had been attacked for relying on the personal and fallible judgment of psychiatrists. But instead, a new objective method based on checklists had been invented. These listed only the objective symptoms and deliberately did not inquire into why individuals felt an anxiety. In the late 80s, nationwide surveys had revealed an incredible picture. More than 50% of Americans suffered from mental disorders. Sad. But at the very same time, the drug companies had announced that they had created a new type of drug called an SSRI, which they claimed targeted the circuits inside the brain that were causing these malfunctions. The SSRIs were marketed under names like Prozac. What they did was alter the amounts of serotonin that flowed across the circuit connections within the brain. They readjusted the chemicals to normal levels. And then all of a sudden, here comes uh, somebody that says, okay, now try these on, try this Prozac on. And I tried them on, and for the first time in my life, I went, whoa, is this the way reality really is? This pill could solve all of your problems. It's called Prozac, and it may mean the end of depression as we know it. I've been taking Prozac for two years. And what difference does that make? Brilliant. Oh, she's yes. smiling. Why is it like that? And I feel like I'm back to normal. You feel normal? Yeah. You feel a better person? Yeah. 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 Through treatment, I learned to function with my disorder, and now life is so much more enjoyable. Life is so much better now that I've gotten treatment, and I feel like I've got my OCD under control, and it feels really great. A better life is waiting. What now began to happen? that millions of people who have been diagnosed by the checklist as disorder went to psychiatrists to be met. Okay, so I found this to be a really interesting, you know, moment in this documentary. It's by the BBC. It's called The Trap. And so I was curious, and so what I did is I, I took these last two screens with the information, and I just sort of entered it into Google to kind of see what would come up. And I came across this press release of Evaluate Group. Um, so one thing that's strange to me is that it seems like a public service announcement more than like an advertisement for a product to like make money. Um, and I, I kind of came to think that, you know, that they had conducted their own research and they paid for their commercial and aligned themselves with nonprofits and, um, well, I mean that they're providing the medication and they're also influencing psychiatrists, not only to diagnose people, but to treat them. Um, so this is, I mean, probably wouldn't be too hard to find it, uh, but when I read through this, this press release, I found some kind of interesting things. Uh, one was that if you notice, they, they used a stat of 50% of the population will have uh, anxiety disorder, something like that. And I kind of wonder where they're getting 50% from, because it really seems high, right? 50% of the population will have one particular disorder when there are about something like 300 in total. And so what about all the other people that have that are diagnosed with everything else. Um, so it reads here, a recent telephone survey found that 50% of 1,000 women polled said that they have experienced anxiety symptoms and worry for a period of more than six months. Um, so I just found it strange, you know, that they would only poll uh, women. And I kind of wondered that, you know, if they sort of polled a, a population, probably people here have taken stats before, um, that if there were lots of men in the sample, maybe just because maybe men just think they have to be manly and so they wouldn't report feeling worry. Like, oh no, I'm not worried, everything's fine. Um, so I just thought maybe it was sort of somehow cherry picked and I, I think it kind of makes sense uh, because, you know, again, reading from, from this press release, the majority of women polled are not aware that these continuing anxiety symptoms and worry may be caused by a common disorder called generalized anxiety disorder, 
The survey was sponsored by Bristol Myers Squibb Company, makers of Boost Bar and anti-anxiety medication. Right, so a kind of conflict of interest arises here um, when you are, you know, making a product and advertising it. And to some extent, this is how all marketing and advertising works, right? That you create a message that your life, you will be better if you consume this product. Can you obtain mental health without our product? Or can you get out of being mentally ill without it? Um, is sort of unclear, I think. Last point I'll say about Big Pharma is there, there is almost a way to sort of quantify their influence, uh, that they're consistently a top five lobbyist group in Washington, D.C., just based on expenditure, right? They spend something like twice as much as Amazon, right, which is sort of a juggernaut of uh, industry. So again, we have this notion of expansion. Um, so I wanted to point to their homepage. And uh, it has these four panels that sort of scroll across. And this is kind of what I thought was, maybe, maybe chilling is the wrong word. Um, but it says, when you can easily determine that a new therapy category is a market opportunity, that's intelligence you can act on. Right? And I just kind of thought it was, it was strange in a way, and I'll, I'll repeat that, that a new therapy category, right, a new thing that you can diagnose people with having, is a market opportunity. Right, because you can offer, I mean, if they have a medical problem, you can offer a medication to make them better. Uh, again, conflict of interest is kind of the point to take away there. So I'm going to have to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, briefly about the DSM. Uh, I know that you've talked about this a little bit, so I'll kind of go over really quickly. Uh, the first DSM was released in 1952. There were about 100 categories. Uh, then DSM-2 had 182, DSM-3, 265, and then DSM-4 got up to 297, right? So in about 40 years, the number of categories of disorder uh, tripled, and as 200 were added to the initial uh, set. And what's interesting now, I think that, you know, that the DSM-5 has come out, and there was pressure that they not just keep adding new, more categories, that people were sort of becoming more skeptical of this approach. And so there was a kind of emphasis to not add more categories to it. And so one of the features that defines the new DSM, uh, the sort of the so-called psychiatrist Bible, the thing that doctors use to diagnose people, um, we had the introduction of what are called spectrums in DSM-5. Right. So no longer are we adding new categories in a kind of list or a column or, you know, thinking back to geometry, think of a kind of a, a Y axis, right? The one that goes up and down. Right. So it's like we're not going to keep adding to the list vertically. Um, and so what spectrums, I think, do in a lot of ways is you allow for a kind of a horizontal X axis expansion that um, let's say if there are nine um, nine categories or nine symptoms of depression. You need at least five out of nine to be considered depressed. Well, what if you only have four out of nine? Um, on the old system, you would not be diagnosed as depressed. But if maybe if three or four, you might be diagnosed with having mild depression, right? That you could be on a spectrum of almost any category. So again, this thinking of um, the sort of bi-directional expansion of psychiatry and as it's expanding is this, you know, this whole idea of just people's problems in living. That that domain is sort of shrinking and psychiatry is expanding. Okay. So I want to make a point about rhetoric. And let's say even if we are willing to assume that there are, um, there are reasons to be doubtful or suspicious of psychiatry, it's sort of the ideas, the assumptions that underlie it. Uh, why is it so successful and why is it so universally accepted? And there are some very good reasons. And I think basically this story has to start with the successes that we've had um, at sort of getting help for people that have addiction by saying and by believing that addiction is a disease. And this really goes back to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, because they realized that, you know, when someone in your family, let's say, has a disease, you see a kind of outpouring of sympathy and care. I have uh, a cousin, her name's Jordan. She had leukemia, 
and spent most of her life at Sick Kids in Toronto and other hospitals in the States. And I mean, you kind of see firsthand that you have this kind of rallying effect, right? And I think it's good for healing. It helps people to get better when people are there and they care. Um, and so before AA introduced this idea of addiction or alcoholism being a disease, often referred to just as the disease, um, they were thought of as, you know, weak or um, as undisciplined deadbeats, you know, um, and that they basically had a bad image, right? Public perception of addicts and alcoholics was, was bad, right? But then if you start saying, you know, tell a family, think of the alcoholic in your family or the addict in your family as someone who has a disease. And you, it's almost like you trigger that kind of affective response to like, you want to help someone that has a disease, right? If someone, you know, because they didn't sort of ask for it and they, it's basically, it's, it's not their fault to some extent. So there was a hope that this portrayal would not only get, you know, it, not only would it improve outcomes by getting people to be more supportive, but it would also inspire insurance companies to expand coverage for addiction programs. And on a third level, right, there's the sort of interpersonal level of families, communities being supportive of addicts, and then getting insurance companies to like pay out money to get help for people that have addiction issues, and getting governments to fund programs for people with addictions, right? And all of these things work in the sense that they they create better outcomes for people that have addictions, right? And so on the one hand, you kind of say, well, it almost doesn't matter if it's true or not that, you know, something like addiction or alcoholism, whether or not it's actually literally a disease, if making people think or convincing people that it is a disease helps them get better, gets insurance companies to pay to help people get better, gets the government to pay to help people get better, uh, that is really what matters. Unless you're a philosopher, in which case what is true is what matters most to you. Right? And this is very much a philosophical critique. Okay. The last point I wanted to make was about, you know, how do we evaluate the success of psychiatry? And, you know, one thing we have to think of is, you know, what are the major achievements in the field of psychiatry, right? Um, do we have cures? Are there, you know, vaccines, immunizations? Um, are we taking old categories and basically they become obsolete because no one has those problems or disorders anymore? Because treatment is so successful. Is there even a knowledge of, you know, how are mental illnesses prevented, right? What are things that I can do to make sure, I'm just going to assume no one in this room wants to become mentally ill or get a mental illness. So how do I maintain mental health? And how do I avoid getting a mental illness, right? What are the risk factors, things like that? And I don't think that there are really clear answers to these questions in the way that there are in sort of medical science of the body. But if we know that mental illnesses are brain disorders or brain diseases and that there's no cure for them, then it's not reasonable to expect very much, right? Like someone with an inoperable brain tumor, <coughs> or it's a terminal case. There's not really, there's nothing you can do. Uh, and so if everyone with a mental disorder has a brain, an underlying brain disorder disease um, that there's no cure for, uh, then again, there's not much we can expect from psychiatry. Um, but shouldn't we, I mean, what is a reasonable expectation of success to justify the continuation of a particular approach? Okay, so the getting into the history and starting when way back to the 1950s, there was a kind of intellectual fallout after World War II. Um, that we sort of had to come to grips with, you know, what just happened with, you know, Nazism and how does an entire society start to have such a kind of a pathological belief and behavior. And so Eric Fromm was, I think, you know, the most articulate on this level. And he basically said, a society can be sick or insane. And therefore, being well-adjusted 
to a particular society says nothing about how sane you are. If you're really well adjusted to a pathological society, someone like Lang might suggest the same thing of the family, right? If your family's totally crazy and you totally fit in with your crazy family, someone on the outside might see you differently, right? Um, and so it's also that we can't be complete cultural relativists. You can't say, well, you know, if you're a Nazi in Nazi Germany and that works for you, then like, then that's fine. That's your choice. Uh, there has to be something more objective or universal. So Fromm basically introduced this notion that mental illnesses don't have to belong to individuals. They can belong to groups, that an entire group can be, an entire society, an entire civilization can be sick or ill, right? So he wrote a book called The Sane Society. So from distinguish between individual and social mental illness, right? It basically says if your culture consensually validates a certain behavior or, you know, belief, uh, then from within that culture, it can't be a disorder. It can't be a pathology. <coughs> so being, again, this idea that being well-adjusted, that adjustment is not a good enough standard for wellness. And his colleague Herbert Marcuse is going to sort of take this even further um, and he directly attacks psychology as becoming this kind of adjustment science right so and he thought that psychology is losing its social substance right so you want happiness but a repressive society only allows for a tightly conform tightly controlled form of happiness so you either have to work to create a less repressive and more liberated society, or you have to conform and compromise and constrict your claims for happiness so they fit in with what's available and what's offered to you within a given society. So you basically have to redefine what you want happiness to be so it's compatible with what's available. Uh, he wrote that psychoanalytic therapy aims at curing the individual so that he can continue to function as part of a sick civilization without surrendering to it altogether. Right? This notion that, that psychology and psychiatry maintain a sublethal existence, right? That you're not really well or healthy, but you're not you're not dead. You're just alive enough to sort of continue to get by. So in this sense, therapy is a course in resignation or giving up. A great deal will be gained if we succeed in transforming your hysterical misery into everyday unhappiness, which is the usual lot of mankind. Not a pretty picture. Uh, the patient becomes capable of adjusting completely to an environment repressive of his mature aspirations and abilities, human potential, etc. So therapy just turns misery into unhappiness so you can get through your day, so to speak. Right? Sort of what Marcuse is suggesting. But he's also very much a revolutionary thinker as well. And you might think that if you really want happiness, you have to create a happier world outside of yourself, not just deal with unhappiness as something specifically individualized to you or in your brain. Uh, and for that, you'll likely need political leaders who represent human interests and don't get assassinated. So coming to Thomas Saz. Um, Zaz is considered by Graham in your textbook to be the arch skeptic. Uh, and I think this is partly because Zaz does not shy away from the controversy of his own ideas at all, right? He has books titled The Myth of Mental Illness and Psychiatry, Science of Lies. So he's not pulling any punches, right? He's definitely embracing this notion of, um, you know, creative difference, let's say. So basically, how can you say that mental illness is, is a myth? He says it's basically a metaphor that's been misunderstood, right? So illness is something that only happens to the body, right? Let's say that your body biologically is made up of tissues, organs, and systems, right? And that your mind is not a part of your body. There's no tissue or organ or system um, that your mind is a part of, right? So your body is corporeal, real, physical, and the mind is incorporeal. Right? The mind is basically our modern equivalent to, in the past, what you might call your soul, your spirit, your psyche, your ego. And none of these things are literally parts of the body. And so they cannot become diseased. They cannot become ill. They can't become sick. 
right? But you can talk about it in a metaphorical sense, right? That it's as if my soul or my, you know, spirit is sick or ill, right? It's a kind of a poetic, you know, way to sort of describe your experience. And he kind of says that it's sort of, it, it started to be taken literally, right? So one way, you know, to think of his point is that if I told you that I had a broken heart, right? A, a cardiologist wouldn't sort of run up here and try to help me or treat me, right? That a broken heart is a metaphorical, you know, expression of, you know, pain, right? Suffering, discomfort. Um, and so, you know, you don't need an ambulance or a doctor or a cardiologist for, you know, for a, a broken heart or uh, an aching heart or even an achy breaky heart. Uh, it just, it, it doesn't, it's just, it's the wrong approach to a broken heart. So Saz does actually think that mental illness is as misled um, or as confused as that. A lot of these thinkers, you know, that I'll try to get to, um, you know, they think of, and I've kind of introduced this idea already, that, you know, we take normal human emotions that we want and that we need and we pathologize or medicalize them and turn them into something else. Um, and the question is, how do we separate those emotions from sort of psychiatric pathologies? Zaz actually takes a different approach that he does, he's not worried about, he's not worried so much about collapsing normal and abnormal emotions. He's worried about the collapse of bad, unwanted behaviors and diseases or disorders. So he says what we often do is we take bad and unwanted behaviors and we combine them with this notion of illness and sickness. That whenever someone does something really bad, we assume they must have an illness or a disorder in some way. And Zaz is kind of old school. He just kind of thinks bad behaviors exist. Um, that healthy brains are capable of bad behaviors. Right? And he thinks that psychiatry is confused in attributing to unwanted behaviors an underlying brain problem. Right? That there might be no problem with your brain and you behave badly anyway. So, for Zaz, by definition, disease means bodily disease. The mind is not literally a part of the body. And so disease is not a concept that applies to the mind. Right? So it's very kind of sober and straightforward and logical in a way. So he thinks collapsing bad behaviors with illness and disease, it makes psychiatry not only false, but also dangerous. Okay, Irving Goffman, very briefly, um, he so he, in 1961, he wrote a book called Asylums, Essays on the Social Situation of Mental Patients and Other Inmates. Title kind of gives a lot away there. Uh, he believes that psychiatric deviancies are constructed by medical and social agencies, right? And he makes a similar but different point to Saz. Um, he basically says that he accepts that mental illness exists and it's real. He says mental illness and physical ailments have entirely separate and distinct logics. And the psychiatric insistence on their juxtaposition is suspect. Right? For Goffman, physical diseases of organisms were distinct from the values and the meaning of persons. Right? So insofar as Goffman says that these two distinct realities right, of mental illness and physical illness that they're collapsed into one thing called psychiatry, right? And he, for this reason, he thinks that psychiatry is confused, right? So Zaz just thinks that there's no such thing as mental illness. Goffman is saying there is mental illness and there are physical ailments, but they're totally different. We shouldn't approach mental illness the same way that we approach physical illness. Ivan Illich, another more kind of radical, politically oriented thinker. Um, the, I think... You know, the most interesting idea here, talking about the medicalization of life, is that diagnoses turn political complaints into therapies, right, into demands for therapies. And he says that this is a major defense of the industrial system. It sort of maintains the status quo. He is also very fond of sort of popularizing this term iatrogenesis, or, you know, when medicine is iatrogenic, it basically just means medicine maketh ill, right? Illness caused by medical examination or treatment, right? 
If you're sick, you go to your doctor, then you're sicker afterwards. There was an iatrogenic effect. So Ivan Illich thinks that in a lot of ways, psychology and psychiatry disable us. Right? They make us feel that we can't cope with our life and our problems. Um, and that the only way to get better is to enter the patient role. Right? And you enter the patient role, and you also you become a consumer. Right? You, you have to consume you know, psychiatric products and services, medications, and that's the only way to get better. Where he thinks you know, suffering and mourning and healing this all happens outside of the patient role. These are just things that human beings as persons can already do. We don't need like medical experts in order to do these things. And he's definitely concerned that human emotional expressions of life, right? Pain, sorrow, torment, suffering, despair, misery, melancholy, that a full palette of sadnesses just become depression. And a full palette of worries, nervousness, dread, anticipation, uneasiness, all becomes anxiety and or stress. So he's concerned that the language in which people could experience their bodies is turned into this kind of um, sanitized clinical vocabulary, right? He's much more in favor of well, what I always think of as, you know, using the language of Shakespeare, right? Having all these sort of rich terms to sort of to describe all the sort of differences in our feelings and our responses to situations um, and sort of reducing it to these sort of medical, you know, these sort of medical categories is unfortunate. Okay, coming to R.D. Lang. Um, I'm going to be brief with Lang because mostly what Lang is doing is offering, he's offering a different picture of what he thinks mental illness is, but I'm going to sort of stick to a, a critical sort of approach. So I'm not presenting other ideas of what mental illness is or could be. I'm sort of confining the topic to what's wrong with psychiatry. So for Lang, there's a fundamental flaw, right? That what psychiatrists do is they study the patient outside of the context of their life, right? Um, that the doctor, as a doctor, only experiences the patient as a clinical entity that's presenting symptoms. Um, Lang firmly believed that you can't really help someone that is having problems if you're unwilling or unable to enter their world. That you have to be able to enter their world in some way uh, to relate to them as a person, as a human being. Um, as long as you have someone in a straitjacket, in a padded cell, and you have the lock for the key that you can enter and exit freely, you're never going to enter this person's world and have a kind of human relationship with them, to understand their life and their context. Uh, and, and what happened to them, right? The nature of their relationships, etc. So Lang basically was horrified by the asylum, right? The medical institution um, of Britain in the 50s and 60s. And he sought to, with you know, other therapists at the time, uh, again, who were you know, personally horrified and professionally dissatisfied with psychiatry and asylums and any kind of involuntary treatment he just thought was, he felt was, um, was torture in a way. So he was more interested in uh, developing appropriate human responses to people who are made frantic by misery. And, you know, also with the belief that, you know, these, you know, having a non-human response to misery, right, instead going to a psychiatric intervention, he says, often doesn't help and can make things worse, right? So Lang, in a nutshell, thinks that when you institutionalize people, you're often dehumanizing them, right? He saw these things as directly related. And so his response was very simple, that we need to deinstitutionalize. We need to get people out of asylums, out of medical hospitals, let them continue to live and struggle in the world, um, and believe that that would be much more humanizing. Thomas Sheff. Um, the only, I mean, Thomas Sheff is still alive, right? Most of these things were born in the 20s, and they had their major works in the 60s and 70s. Um, Sheff is a professor emeritus, still alive today. So Sheff is what's called a social labeling theorist, right? And he has an interesting idea that, you know, when the, whenever there's a kind of rule breaking, um, whenever you sort of violate any kind of norm or social taboo, what you need to do is to sort of 
disapprove of it, right? You sort of say no. Um, even you could say you sort of stigmatize bad behaviors to stop them from happening. But he says, um, if you do that, then the problem will usually be transitory, right? It'll kind of go away. If, however, labeling occurs, right, the rule breaking that would otherwise have been terminated, compensated for, channeled, is stabilized. He says when you label someone as having a disorder or disease, you are stabilizing that disorder, right? And so the offender, he writes, is launched on a career of mental illness. So he thinks that if you don't label people, if you just kind of make it seem like, basically you kind of normalize it as saying it's a phase to some extent, right? Then madness or mental illness may be more fluid, right? That anxiety and depression, they come and go. But if you are diagnosed as having anxiety or depression, then it makes it sort of stable or permanent in a way. And you start to identify like that your identity becomes wrapped up in the thing that you're labeled as, right? That you start to see yourself as an anxious or as a depressed person. So like he says, it's stabilized. It doesn't dissipate or transform or redirect or change. He thinks that, you know, mental illness, mental illnesses are not neutral, value-free, scientifically precise terms, right? He says the medical model uh, refers to these culture-free, independent processes, right? In, in medicine, in physical medicine, right, the public order doesn't really factor in. Uh, but he says mental illness is different. Mental illness is not culture-free. Uh, that these are offenses against implicit understandings of particular cultures, right? He's saying that when you, you can, if you offend a particular cultural understanding enough, you can become labeled and diagnosed with having a mental illness. He likes the example of withdrawal, right? Withdrawal is when you're sort of, you know, maybe somewhat similar to shyness or sort of a social anxiety, right? That withdrawal, he writes, assumes that there's a standard of sort of how close you should be with other people, like the appropriate amount of distance or intimacy or familiarity with people. Um, whereas he thinks that there, there is no standard of like how interpersonal and how friendly or outgoing you should be, right? Um, in the sense of this notion of a standard, you know, behavior, um, it sort of is problematic because there is no standard human being. People are different. So for Chef, there's no such thing as mental illness. It's a social construction. And he believes that there is no scientific verification of the cause, course, site of pathology, right? Unlike in physical medicine, there are no uniform and invariant signs and symptoms and treatment of choice, right? It just doesn't exist or doesn't exist yet in psychiatry the way it does in physical medicine of the body, right? So I think the distinction to make here is that there is psychiatric consensus. There's consensus that, you know, mental illnesses are sort of indicative of brain disorders, which is different from the certainty in medicine, right? Saying that there's still an assumption. So coming to post-psychiatry now and sort of coming towards the end, what have I got, like uh, five minutes? 25. 25, okay, great. Good to know. Um, okay, so Duncan Double, uh, it's his real name, uh, had a great 2002 essay uh, called The Limits of Psychiatry, where he kind of tries to um, wrap up what he thinks um, the problems with psychiatry are and what you know, anti-critical post-psychiatry is. Basically, he says, the most important idea is that you have to refocus, right, these psychiatric approaches um, on the patient and think of them as a person, right? This whole notion of persons over patients is, you know, core to what is called post-psychiatry today. Totally a Langian idea, I think. Um... And there's, you know, there's a tendency that we think that we're going to use mental health care as a panacea or as a cure-all for all kinds of different personal and social problems. Focusing on the somatic nature of disorder denies the patient as a person. It objectifies the patient, right? You become an object or a clinical entity. You're a thing that has signs and symptoms 
a thing to be diagnosed, a thing to be treated and medicated, or confined in some cases, right? institutionalized. And the somatic model, right, has always tended to dominate psychiatric thinking, right? And this idea that, you know, by being more scientific, uh, that it sort of lends credibility and sort of professional security to the field of psychiatry. Treating mental illness as something distinct from the mind and of the body, right, is, you know, for these critical thinkers, the heart of the problem, right? With categories and understandings of disease and disorder, diagnosis and treatment, right? A medical approach. Whereas more philosophical approaches to understanding people and their life story and their context, right? This is called as uh, narrative therapy approaches. Um, that these are, that they're not serious. They're not scientific. You're not using, you know, real medical science. So he points out that psychiatry needs to return to what he calls a biopsychological view to limit its excesses. Right? That psychiatry is too excessively wants to be medical and scientific. Whereas, you know, understanding a human being's pain and torment and trauma, that it might not, science might not be the right tool for doing that, is kind of the point. And of course, there are lots of people in the helping professions that are doing like amazing work. Um, but the critical psychologist would say they're doing amazing work not because of the model that they're in of psychiatry, but in spite of it, right? Okay. So in 2007, there was um, a very interesting book called The Loss of Sadness, right? Again, you're noticing this theme of, you know, normal emotion and abnormal emotion. And the authors argue that we've misunderstood and reclassified normal human sadness as largely an abnormal experience. Right, and this fails to take into context, uh, fails to take into account context. It doesn't account for context, right? There's an importance that's stressed on, we need to distinguish between abnormal reactions uh, due to internal dysfunction and normal sadness brought on by external circumstances, right? So how, how can you tell the difference between, you know, internal dysfunction happening in the brain causing someone to be chronically unhappy or depressed, um, and then sadness brought on by external circumstances, things happening to you in your life? And in the book, they argue that this distinction is impossible, that no doctor anywhere can reliably tell the difference between has this person had a miserable life and been treated poorly? Um, or is there something going wrong with their brain? And so they're definitely, you know, critical of, you know, this whole notion of a chemical imbalance, right? Which is, lar which is widely accepted, but, you know, in post-psychiatry, they are pointing out to ways in which this is becoming more and more suspect and suspicious, right? Um, you know, you could characterize this notion of, you know, chemical imbalance and genetic predispositions creates this notion of a kind of uh, like a runaway brain, right? That I didn't do it. I didn't say that. It was my brain that did it, right? And Thomas S. picks up on this in Criminal Defenses, um, that it was your schizophrenia or your bipolar disorder that made you do something unlawful. And it's entered and accepted into um, court systems. So... Two other key texts that I'll get to, and then I'll wrap up. Um, they are Towards Psychologies of Liberation and Demedicalizing Misery, right? So very briefly, Towards Psychologies of Liberation suggests that understanding the psychological well-being of individuals is linked to the health of their communities, their environments, their cultures. And Demedicalizing Misery suggests that Psychiatry and psychology have constructed a mental health system that does no justice to the problems it claims to understand and creates more problems. The myth of biologically based mental illness defines our present and the book Demedicalizing Misery rethinks madness and misery and distress and wants to reclaim them as human experiences, not as medical experiences. 
So one of my favorite concepts, you know, coming out of the Watkins and Shulman towards psychologies of liberation text is what's called night vision. They say that, you know, when a psychologist is able to criticize the society for, you know, making or giving people, you know, mentally ill kind of symptoms, then if it has a kind of uh, a subversive insight into what's wrong with the world around you, right, that's referred to here as night vision, right? And there's an argument that psychologists and psychiatrists traded in this night vision. Um, and they became totally focused on just adjusting people to society. Right? That the problems aren't in society, the problems are in you. It's not me, it's you. So by trading in subversive insights that link suffering to culture, right, in order to gain professional security, they say that there, we, there's a whitening that occurs in psychology. Okay. Many analysts went white and pursued privilege. Psychoanalysis gave up its night vision trading in subversive insight for conformity to the status quo. Night vision is the ability to critique society and to examine its psychical, psychological implications from the position of an outsider and a critic. Right? And this allows us to begin to see what psychological suffering is linked to in culture. Right? If the culture that you're in is not conducive to psychological health, um, then treating the individual, in this sense, colludes with the forces that cause distress, right? That when, if culture is making people sick and you're treating the sick individuals, to some extent you are implicated in sort of covering up what is going bad and wrong about society that's making people ill. Okay, coming to another point from Psychologies of Liberation. Um, they think that basically and this, you might have you might be familiar with this idea that treating the symptoms of someone's condition, right? If you are depressed, right, you can be brought up to a level um, of you can basically be stimulated in a way. Um, and if you're too anxious, you can be brought down a little bit. The notion of sort of adjusting people's, you know, emotional lives uh, so they better fit in culture or society. Um, this is also thought of as you know a kind of Band-Aid solution that doesn't treat the core or the heart or the real root cause. Um, it's very common and it's also very humane to want to treat someone's symptoms, right? To make someone feel better right now is something that we should definitely be doing. But it can, it can become a problem with mental health and mental illness um, because it can be seen as erasing the only path or route you have to understanding the real root causes. Right, that the symptoms um, need to be listened to and attended to, that you need to apprentice these symptoms uh, in order to understand what's really going wrong. Right, and they write that premature erasure, right, prematurely erasing symptoms by drugs can destroy a fragile potential bridge, leaving the site of where we are struggling in our lives utterly disconnected from the meaning and understanding that we desperately need to orient us. So we need to see symptoms in terms of surrounding cultural discourses, right? And that requires, you know, that you have to be able to criticize the environment. We have to interpret symptoms in relation to community and cultural life. We have to connect psychological healing with cultural transformation and social transformation. To do so would position psychology as a countercultural discipline. Right? If you kind of point out all the ways that culture and society are making people feel bad, um, then you would risk or you would sacrifice mainstream support and financial viability. Right? So instead, they're suggesting that psychology and psychiatry are conservative, not countercultural disciplines. And that that's part of the problem. We have to follow the symptom into its context, right? even if it seems dangerous to do so in an authoritarian, oppressive environment, right? But if we don't think about the symptoms in context in life and in society, we can misinterpret it. Uh, we misinterpret its protest and negate its voice. What is truly threatening to psychiatry is evidence that both the form and the content of emotional distress and disordered behavior are, 
systematically meaningful and related to social context and life experience. Right? It's threatening because the authority of psychiatry comes from the DSM. Right? Um, psychiatry is explicitly justified on the basis that behaviors and experiences that are said to constitute mental disorders, they're not meaningful, they're not intelligible. Right? They are just the outward symptoms of an internal pathology, right? an, an individual deficit. Right? Am, I, am I okay for time? 15? Okay. So the last book I want to talk about is Demedicalizing Misery. Um, and they also talk about this notion of, you know, psychology and psychiatry as kind of colluding or kind of almost helping the modern state cover up the structural problems by assuming individual problems, right? That if you don't fit into the world, it's your problem and you need to be made to fit rather than, you know, creating a world that more people fit into, right? Or creating a world that is less wounding. So when you minimize or deny the importance of life experience and social context, you're choosing not to expose the operation of power, right? And when you don't expose the operation of power or um, kind of oppressive, repressive ideologies in society, you gain a double advantage of both appearing more scientific, right? And also of avoiding the risk of offending the powerful by implicating them in causing distress to others. So we need theories which explicitly link the social and context uh, to right, the behavioral and the psychosocial. And these are the kinds of theories that mainstream psychology and psychiatry have been reluctant to develop. So going further, the explicit links between sort of historical context, um, you know, and sort of contemporary life, that we need to address, you know, power, and we also need to address the way that psychiatry seems to want to avoid context, right? They talk about psychiatry's context avoidance problem, right? As if psychiatry is afraid that if it looks too closely at context, it'll realize that, uh, that its model and its assumptions are wrong, right? If you can make people better by understanding them and sort of unraveling or untying the knots um, of their experience, then it would mean that they didn't really have an underlying brain disorder, right? Uh, if a non-medical approach worked better, it would be a threat to this institution. Psychiatric diagnoses and medications are, in uh, Dylan's opinion, based on the false premise that human misery and distress are caused by chemical imbalances and genetic predispositions, right? And that ignores or minimizes the social causes. Not only is it thought to be false, but it's also thought to be a kind of a fraud, right? The traditional view that psychiatric drugs treat or target underlying diseases or correct chemical imbalances is a fraud. Uh, it was adopted not because there was evidence to support it, but because it served the vested interests of the psychiatric profession, the pharmaceutical industry, and the modern state. Instead, it is proposed that psychiatric drugs work by creating altered mental states, right? That you, there's something sort of experimental going on that when you give someone medication, sometimes you'll have to try a couple different medications to find one that works, and it makes the person function better. But I think ADHD uh, in Ritalin is an interesting example um, that if you have, let's say, 25% of a school population that doesn't want to sort of sit in a chair and face the front like you're all doing so wonderfully right now, um, that for some people that just doesn't work, right? And so the, it would be more difficult to change the whole school educational structure, right? Um, and it's easier to kind of say like, no, the problem is with you as the individual who doesn't want to just sit there and be quiet and listen. And so you adjust the person to fit the structure. But if the structure or the system doesn't work for a huge you know, percentage of the population, um, then you have to start thinking about making 
what you would call structural changes. So in conclusion, uh, for these sort of critical post-psychiatric thinkers, the idea that our discontents are a manifestation of faulty brains that can be abolished with sophisticated medical treatment is an illusion. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Um, I guess we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes for questions, comments, concerns. Uh, I guess we'll go students first, and you can, yeah, if there aren't any. Yeah. Covered a lot of ground today. Yeah. A lot of important stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I did kind of think about, you know, would it be appropriate to say at the beginning that some of this stuff might be, you know, uh, offensive or difficult and, you know, uh, statistically speaking, there, there are people in here that have had experiences of other people who have had, you know, mental illnesses or disorders. And um, there is something, you know, there is something obviously deeply personal about it. Um, and there are people who are diagnosed and medicated and then start to feel and to live better, right? So that's always, you know, a, a very good critique that, you know, I often kind of expect and anticipate in a way. You know, my brother or sister or whatever was diagnosed and medicated and now is like a million times better. So what do you say to that? Um, and that's, I mean, it's hard to say. And it is still very much, um, you know, there's, it's still contested ground, I think. Question? Um, today, like, it seems like we're making a, a necessary uh, one or the other, right? We're treating mm -hmm. psychology versus society. Yeah. Um, but societal changes take a long time. Mm -hmm. And so in the meantime, necessarily wrong to treat people, but I also understand that in doing that, you can get away from societal constructs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, I, what you're suggesting is this notion of, uh, you know, a kind of a, a false alternative or an excluded middle. Um, and it is, I, I mean, it's a great point that what are you supposed to do, right? Let's say I'm a psychologist and you come into my office or, you know, that your family's really worried about you or whatever. And, uh, and the, you know, the, the clinician just says, well, you know, it's... Wait till the liberals are elected. Yeah. Or if they say, you know, sorry, that's, you know, that's just capitalism, right? A fact of our reality is exploitation and alienation. And until you, you know, change the structure of society, there's nothing I can do to help you. Like, if a doctor can't just say that to somebody. Like, go make revolution, right? But the, but the concern is that, you know, you don't want to make these feelings go away. It's almost like... You want people's anxiety and depression and just misery to like fully mature and develop to such a point where, you know, people say, you know, I just, I, I can't get through another day of this, right? And that could trigger a response of saying, well, then this, we need to like, you know, medicate this person to help them to be able to get through another day. But you can also think of it from a more revolutionary perspective. It's like, I can't put up with this any longer. I don't know if you've seen the movie Network, a great movie from 1976. And it's like, if you're mad as hell and you can't take it anymore, then, you know, as Mario Savo says, you have to throw yourself upon the gears and the levers and say that this society isn't going to work unless it works for us, too. I think you argue that there's a deeper sort of financial or psychological changes that we need to do or doing that can be done. That many people make the argument that if you want some kind of larger structural social change, it requires some sort of say that there are some, you know, I'm not going to label them as I'm not sort of looking for a system that pushes these things in place, but the two work together as sort of these sort of changes, yeah. like structural change, and therefore there must be some sort of psychological change in the world that way, and there's some sort of treatment that we're doing in some sort of understanding. Yeah, I think it's just a fabulous point. Um, so you think of, you know, um, symptoms of someone that might have what we call major depression, right? Someone that, just the idea of getting up out of bed and getting rest just brings them to tears, right? These are not, it would seem, these are not the people who are going to change society. 
right? And so maybe there is a kind of a need for intervention to get people to a point where they can function and engage and, you know, form coalitions and, you know, have a kind of presence in social public life. Uh, whereas if your, you know, sort of symptoms are too debilitating or crippling, then yeah, I mean, you're, it's going to be very hard. I mean, if you can't, if you, you know, if you literally cannot get up out of bed, then yeah, I think that there is, um, but do we help that person with depression to get out of bed? Do we do it with medication? Um, thank you. Great, great, great stuff. Please. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give a very brief response, and then I'll, I'll give the final word to Professor Genovese on just on whatever you want to comment on, kind of put a bow on it, so to speak. But I'll say that, um, you know, you kind of mentioned, you know, that, that the, the narrative focuses on, you know, good mental health. And I think, you know, I don't even think we know what good mental health is, right? I mean, what, what is a good mentally healthy person? Um, and again, I think it's also very philosophical at this point. Is mental health just the absence of mental illness, right? And so then that's what you call a negative understanding of mental health, right? It's just the absence of something bad, right? Or is mental illness, is mental health its own positive thing? Um, you know, and we've heard a lot about, you know, chemical imbalances, right? But the notion that, you know, any doctor anywhere knows, okay, here is what a good chemical balance is. These are the right chemicals that should be in your brain at any given time. Um, that has been described as science fiction. Right? The idea that we know what chemical balance in your brain is supposed to be like. Um, so I still think, yeah, uh, I still think that basically the most important point is, or the takeaway is to just to be agnostic, right? That we don't really know what mental health and mental illness are, right? <clears throat> And sometimes when you put a lot of pressure on uh, on psychology and psychiatry, say, tell us what it is, because we want to know, we want to understand this phenomenon. And when you put too much pressure to come up with an answer, sometimes you come up with, with an answer that is, you know, it's it's reached prematurely, right? And then you feel like you just have to stay committed to it. Um, okay, so I'll stop. Uh, final, final word? Uh, unfortunately, I have no verbal wrapping paper uh, for anyone anymore, so uh, I think we're going to stop there. Uh, but I do want to say... Uh, thank you to everyone uh, for the entire semester. You guys have been great. Mm -hmm. Discussions have been fantastic. Uh, thank you for your uh, patience uh, with me at times, and, uh, and you've been great for the So again, uh, I'd like to extend the invitation. Uh, Mr. Clemens and I are going to be going to Mike's place for a few years. If you guys like to come, I'd like to have you. Um, and, uh, have a great uh, ending semester. Thank you.